Now, okay, we, we talked a lot about professional astronauts, NASA, ESA, whatever. But as we know, and we're seeing and explored in other parts of this course, we'll see private people are now going to space. So how does that change things? I mean, clearly it has to, we know physically it probably does, but also it clearly has to do this as well, right? No, they're great questions. I mean, what is what kind of fitness, broadly defined, uh, does a member of the public have to have to travel to space, right? And how would we assess that? Who would assess it? Uh, who's going to say, yes, you're you know, capable of flying? Um, you know, when more and more people are going, are we going to go, are we going to see more and more issues around that? Uh, and there's lots of questions that we don't know the answers to that are going to need to be sorted out about how you might select people for that fitness, yep. both in terms of physical health, which we might be uh, able to determine a bit more straightforwardly, but in terms of um, psychological ability to deal with stress, ability yeah. to deal with ice, you know, how do we both select people to be able to go or might we train them? Yeah. Why, might we need more facilities such that people can have a go and see whether it's really going to be for them before they're forking out what might be a lot of money uh, <laughs> to realise that they weren't actually, they weren't actually ready. Yeah, because right? Yeah. right now they're, they're, none of that exists, right? It's kind of, sure. We'll give you a seat if you have the money. There is no oversight. There is no trading for the most part. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the companies, their requirements are you can just not go to the toilet for two hours and like that's the extent <laughs> of what you have to prepare for. So this clearly, and, and as, you, as we were just exploring, we've had issues really in the past in space and that was a short-term Skylab mission. This wasn't a long-term Mars mission. So as these short-term missions go into space, do you think we'll start seeing issues in, in this area of private people going up? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why either it's going to be very difficult to get insurance for those kind of activities. So perhaps it will be driven there, yep. you know, to actually want some sort of verification that these people, that the public yep. is able to travel. Uh, but it is also the case that it's not simply this idea of just selecting. It would be good for people to know what an ice environment yeah, is going to yeah, be like. Yeah. You know, can they sort of manage it? How do they go in that environment? So these trial sites to mm. enable that to happen. Uh, but also uh, this area of countermeasures, right? How might we yeah. be from the ground? How might experts on the ground be understanding how people are coping? Perhaps have some countermeasures ready to go. Uh, and to be forewarned, I guess, yeah. as much as possible on any issues that are emerging. And there may be less team-based exercises going on in space, but you've still got to very much be able to get on and, and work with others. And things can go wrong, yeah. such that you're going to need to be able to do those things. So it could well be that some of that pri private travel space is going to also be really important in helping us understand okay. uh, you know, what might, what might go on broadly with space travel, even for astronauts. So there's kind of has to be a mixture, it sounds like, of prevention potentially in screening or checks, but then preparation and then mitigation when they're there. Like, it's not just to say, hey, we'll just screen these people out and solve it. You really, it's going to need to be this multifaceted approach to safe, effective space travel if this is going to be the big thing that it's going to be. Absolutely, in, in particular if it's for longer periods of time. Yeah. So the mitigation uh, is an area where there is a lot of work that needs to be done and also on, on the selection and training. And what, see, what we seem to be good at, because it tr translates some of the, the knowledge we have here on Earth, I guess, to a space environment, is how we might identify individuals but we don't do a very good job at knowing how those individuals are going to work together. We're not very good at, at actually putting teams of people together that could maximise success. Mm. Uh, so that is a whole sort of new area of work in, in group dynamics, really, uh, and monitoring those teams. And of course, they're things that we're very interested in here at the ANU. Uh, and, you know, we need to develop a really lively programme of work around some of those questions. So, you know, famously, there's, you know, movies, Martian, the Matt Damon, person alone on Mars, and he bumbles his way through, but that clearly seems to not, not just not even be the realistic case, but where the effort is going. Because, you know, everyone is longer term to the moon, longer term to Mars, and that's where the work is happening. So how does this affect space psychology and these missions? 
Yeah, it definitely is tilting towards understanding group-based activity. So uh, group-based problem solving, what kind of experts do you need? How are those experts going to work together? Have we had teams of people working already for long periods of time, mm. even three years perhaps, mm. in some of these analog sites. So we know that this is a team that has got some of the things that we think are going to be important. You know, you can imagine that we may not be just testing individuals, but testing groups yeah. in these analog environments. So there's a very deliberate program of work that is going to be needed around some of those questions. There's also this idea that it might be, you know, a series of sort of space stations, space station maybe hovering, you know, and people going up and down. It may yeah. not be as we might imagine it, you know, a, a, a sort of colony on Mars. Yep. Uh, but all of those are going to, you know, mean that you might not be interacting even with the one team from when you left to when you arrived, but multiple teams as you, you go through some sort of space station hop. So, you know, there is going to be a lot of work to be done to monitor how all those groups are going, uh, to understand how people coming and going might affect those groups, how the groups are able to deal with uh, problems and problem solve, and what kind of experts do we need? Like, you know, who yeah. do we need at, you know, on site, I guess, uh, to deal with everything that we have to do while we're there. Well, that's what I was about to say, because like, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, clearly you probably need someone to pilot it. Okay, sure, we, we get that. I mean, you know, even now when NASA selects astronauts, they don't just select people from medical backgrounds. They want people that have, even if they're not a trained medical doctor, they have some experience. You know, you often see a lot of the astronauts have some prior flight experience, even if it wasn't a fighter pilot or something like that. So do you think this is probably gonna have to start weighing in? People who have some knowledge of, you know, these psychological issues, because are, are we gonna have a Martian counselor? You know, I, I think that's a great question because if it really is these long-term missions, this has to clearly be part of the portfolio of skills these people have going up there, right? Yeah, they've either been trained incredibly well here on the ground, yeah. such that the whole team has some of these capabilities and skills, uh, or there is, some sort of facilitator protocols that groups go through that, that sort of leadership might manage, you know, on these uh, flights. Mm. Or you have a medical professional who has an understanding of both, you know, the mind, yeah. you know, and the body, so to speak, a sort of new age doctor. And I know we've got programs here at ANU where we're trying to, to train. Uh, these future doctors to have strength in both those kind of areas. But that is going to be necessary because lots of the issues are going to be ones to do with the people part uh, of these missions and mission success. Yeah, and I, and I think this is kind of something that always strikes me is when people make a list of, hey, we're going to Mars. It's like, all right, we need a reusable rocket. We need fuel. We need water. But this is actually where a lot of the work is going that people just don't appreciate, right? Is, no, is right. in this issue, yeah? So it is a very crowded dance floor. And one of our challenges is to get the human factors piece front and center. Yeah. Because you imagine, you know, compared to the engineering to get you there, uh, you know, where does the people piece yeah. sort of fit? Uh, how, making sure you've got enough oxygen to survive, where does the people piece fit? And so, helping everyone realize just how important this is to mission success is also a challenge. So when there is funding available, you know, it's often not going to this question, but others. So how yeah. do we, you know, how do we get this problem front and center and make sure the research is done uh, to enable psychology uh, and human factors kind of expertise to support missions like this? So, I mean, in your broad, quick assessment, do you actually think that people will be able to manage living on Mars, like genuinely? I mean, clearly we've had issues on Earth, we've had issues on Skylab and in the space. Do you think this is actually a solvable problem? Uh, you know, uh, it may, no may not be the right answer because I think that's one of the things that people just assume things in space will be solved if enough people are working on it. But I think we're starting to find out that there are some things that are really, really challenging and it isn't just the rockets. No, I think that's right. I mean, we need to do the work, right? Yeah. So the so there are programs of work. NASA is obviously focusing on some of these issues. Uh, other b bodies and research groups are, but I think we need to really upscale the speed at which we're doing mm. this work. Uh, so for example, to date, the idea that you might select different teams of people yep. on certain 
um, criteria and put them into an ice environment and study them all in real time to say, well, what are the team characteristics that drove success? That work hasn't been done. Okay. Uh, and so, sure, we've selected individuals and put them in, uh, but have we actually tried to find the right team mm. and work out what makes that team successful? Uh, that hasn't been done or, or done, uh, it hasn't been done and it needs to be done a lot. Uh, lots of multiple sites where that work's being done. The other is the unobtrusive measures of how the team is functioning. Uh, there have been monitors developed uh, to assess things like mood and, and valence and language uh, without sort of revealing what people are saying, but the tone in which mm. they're saying it. Uh, but we need to get those unobtrusive measures also much more, much more advanced to be able to monitor these teams and then know when we put these countermeasures or mitigation strategies into place. And then I guess you have to then fold in the fact that on some of these longer simulated missions, people have had issues. So now you then have to test all of this for six months, a year, exactly. two years, exactly. and then you have to do it a few times and a few different combinations of teams. So it's not a problem that's solved next year. This is literally decades long problem here, right? And, uh, you know, dedicated program coordinated across multiple sites, multiple researchers uh, to enable that to happen. So that, um, that program of work has only been partly mapped out. Mm. Uh, it's been identified as a major risk. Uh, it's been identified that mitigation and countermeasures are going to be sort of needed. But the development though of those is still slow progress. And, and, and I think this is kind of the interesting, maybe isn't the right word, but the interesting thing about this field is that it seems so critical success of everything that people want to do in space, yet it's hard. Humans are hard, right? I mean. Humans are hard things to study and factor, and yet, if this clearly all this work is needed and all this effort's needed, and as you said, that you know the risk is high, but the mapping hasn't been there, this seems like something that will slow down progress more than people think. Absolutely, or we'll just have missions that fail, and then people might make you know these these investments. But it, I think it is a coordinated strategy yeah. is needed. The human factors uh, is needed. There are you know, green shoots here in Australia where we're trying to do some of that work. We have some expertise around uh, group processes and intergroup relations that um, that can be sort of brought to the table and studied very deliberately. Uh, but it is a matter of, you know, the experts in the area really coming together in a coordinated way to make the case for these human factors issues and to map out that work uh, that needs to be done. Um, I, I, as I understand it, uh, Elon Musk went to the Mars Society in, in the US in the early days yeah. and asked them, and of course there's, there's these societies yeah. all around the world, and asked them, okay, so how close are we? Are we ready to go yet? And, you know, it became clear to him that there wasn't, yeah. you know, there wasn't this mapped out plan. He said, right, well, let's get one. Let's, yeah. let's put it together and look where we are now. That same kind of um, vision and drive and plan is needed in, in the human factors space. and. You know, there are lots of green shoots, but we really need those to come together to, uh, to make a forest so that we're very ready to go to space. Yeah.